we're thrilled to have Patricia Cummins from the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, and she's sort of an icon in the conviction integrity world, which is why we wanted to have her come and speak today. Um, she has a long career where she w worked for a court and was a county prosecutor, and then some years as a um, defense attorney, um, but really, uh, I guess, got into this field of eviction integrity units in Dallas, which was a very well-known, we have some representatives from Dallas here today, a very well-known and, and high-functioning conviction integrity unit. Um, and then now is heading up the conviction, conviction integrity unit in Philadelphia. I don't know if you followed what's gone on there with uh, Larry Krasner, um, it was a long time civil rights attorney and defense attorney being elected and sort of being sort of the first district attorney in the country who ran on a very a progressive um, judicial, or excuse me, criminal justice reform platform and got elected. And so what he did was he turned to Patricia to come and um, develop the conviction integrity unit. So thank you very, very much for being here. We're very looking forward to hearing your comments. Can you hand me the clicker so I don't have to go up there? I'm sorry? Uh, the clicker. I'm going to not stand up at the podium. Um, like so many trial lawyers, as my colleagues have told me, I'm going to probably walk around and I might end up sitting next to you if I'm not careful. So um, thank you very much, Mark. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to add just a little bit to my background so you can understand why I'm asking the question, why choose to go to the moon? Um, I did a lot of different things, but predominantly my career was over two decades of being a defense lawyer. And and my first experience in dealing with wrongful convictions and actual innocence cases involved the case of Michael Morton out of Texas. And Michael Morton was one of my clients, and along with many other lawyers, we had a pretty awesome legal team. And I was on that legal team for over a decade. Um, and Michael was convicted of a murder back in 1987 in the county that I kind of grew up in and learned how to be a lawyer, both as a prosecutor and as a defense lawyer. Um, and so I was the local lawyer tasked with trying to prove that he, in fact, had been wrongfully convicted of murdering his wife and that he had been sentenced wrongfully to serve life in prison. So this decade-long escapade, I will say, um, changed me as a person and changed me as a lawyer. And after we managed to get Michael out of prison and after we managed to help convict the real perpetrator of who committed the crime, we also spent quite a bit of time trying to hold the prosecutor accountable for some pretty egregious Brady violations. And what was really spectacular for me, aside from the story and the experience, was that all of the players involved in the case were people that I knew and, and were my friends. In fact, the prosecutor that ultimately got prosecuted for the Brady violations would have told people for almost two decades he was my mentor. So it was this kind of weird dynamic. And as I said, it changed me dramatically. And one once we reached the end of the case, which was around in 2013, 2014, it was hard for me to go back to my everyday criminal defense practice. So I was tasked with the question of what was the next chapter in my life? And I was very lucky because the next chapter became go to the legislature and try to change the laws that allowed what happened to Michael to happen to other people. And so one of the first endeavors that I had was working at the state capitol in Austin to try to rewrite the way we had done criminal discovery in Texas for 50 years. And lo and behold, we were successful. Um, we came out of that session being able to pass what's been known or come to be known as the Michael Morton Act, which in Texas is synonymous with forcing prosecutors to open their file to the defense. So hopefully, we could minimize the risk of Brady violations and also at the same time, maybe minimize ineffective assistance of counsel. So I went down that road of trying to focus on policy and probably about halfway down that road I was, I was kind of closing up my criminal defense practice and one of the last cases I tried I was shocked because it was so much like Michael Morton's case. Um, I tried a case where I believed my young client who was 18 years old was actually innocent of what he was accused of committing. I went in and tried the case. It was the hardest case of my career and I lost. 
and my client was ser uh, sentenced to serve 25 years day for day in prison and it was for, like I said, something I believe he didn't do. And so in the midst of dealing with that crisis and trying to do something different to try to make our criminal justice system better and our world better, I got this phone call from somebody in Dallas. And the phone call was, hey Patricia, they just elected a new DA in Dallas and she needs somebody to come up and run her conviction integrity unit. You want to do it? I had never even considered it. I had never even thought about leaving my hometown of Austin at that point. I was taking care of my mother who was 80 years old. But there was something incredibly attractive about the idea of being able to go to Dallas and do conviction integrity work. So it was just a short time later that I actually said yes and I moved myself and my family to Dallas to do the work. And it was incredible work. I spoke about that job for a couple of years and I said that, although I had done lots of wonderful things and been lucky in my career, but that was the best thing that I had ever done as a lawyer. Unfortunately, the elected DA that hired me had some mental health issues and it wasn't long into my tenure in that position, in her tenure as the elected DA, that she actually had to resign from her position. Believing in conviction integrity work like I do, I recognize that because she resigned, I needed to go. Because I understood that whoever does conviction integrity work has got to have a close relationship with their elected DA and it's so important to have the trust between the two that since she was gone, I didn't know who was going to take her place and I didn't feel like I had any right to hold on to that position. So I went back to Austin, started working for the Innocence Project, and then, lo and behold, not a year later, I get a phone call from somebody about Larry Krasner being elected in Philadelphia and asking me, Patricia, do you want to go to Philadelphia and run the Conviction Integrity Unit? That was shocking. I had left my mother, I had left my home to go to Dallas, and I was back at home, and I really thought I would probably never do it again. But I understood that when I was asked to do that job, there was something in my gut that said, you got to do it. So less than six weeks later, after getting that phone call, I once again packed up my things, packed my family and my cat. Next thing you know, I'm in Philadelphia, quite frankly, freezing my ass off, um, having been a longtime Texas girl. So I explain all of that to you because I think that if you know a little bit more about that journey, I think you can understand why I'm asking the question in front of you all today, why choose to go to the moon? Conviction integrity work from Dallas to Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And here I am. And what I want to do is I want to try to share my experience in those very different worlds with you all to see are there certain takeaways and lessons that I've learned that might be able to help you in your endeavors. So the, the kind of map or framework of my presentation is really going to be broken down into these three factors that are on the slide in front of you. And you guys have heard that from everybody yesterday and today. There are common themes in terms of how do we do this work. What you will see in my speech, and I think what you've seen yesterday and today, is that although there are these common themes, depending on the jurisdiction you practice in, depending on your personality, you might deal with them a little different. But clearly, I hope you all heard very loud and clear that issues that we have to grapple with when we do this work are resources, the culture of the office that we're dealing with, and finally, what are the best practices to try to make sure that we're successful in trying to do what we set out to do? I wanted it to be nice and tidy, and I wanted it to be like five takeaways or 10, but the reality is every time I thought about this, something new would come to mind. And so I think at the end of the day, when I put this presentation together, I think there were eight takeaways, but we'll see by the time I sit down what, I'm, what I end up with. First and foremost, I've already hinted at this in terms of my elected DA in Dallas and me making the decision to leave that job, and that is in order to do this work, you've got to have support from the top. What that means is your elected DA has got to have buy-in to the whole concept of conviction integrity work, number one, and then they've got to be able to give you the support, give you the support that you need in order to make it happen. 
one of the prosecutors in my unit, when we were working on this presentation, we kind of argued back and forth about, do you really have to have it? Do you need it? Is must have and need the same thing? And at the end of the day, my lesson from Dallas was, I think I want to tell everybody you must have it, but I think there is a difference between must have and need. And I'm going to settle for need because fortunately, when I was in Dallas, I was able to get a lot of work done. And you guys heard from Cynthia Garza on the panel yesterday. She actually talked about a lot of cases that we worked together. And we managed to do those even though we had a largely absent elected DA because, as I said, she was suffering from serious mental health issues. And most of my tenure, she was not even in the office to give our unit the support we needed. But it was clear that because she had bought into the concept and she had brought me in to do the job, we were still able to get a lot done during the time that I was in Dallas. How many of you guys are familiar with John Hallway? A few of you. Um, so let me, let me add, because it's so important for you guys to understand some of my takeaways and my lessons to have some idea of who John Hallway is. So as you can see on the slide up here, I am referencing uh, an incredible paper that John Hallway wrote. And it came out in September, I think, of 2016. Actually, it was published in April of 2016. John runs the Quattrone Center, which is located at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And John has spent largely the last three or four years of his career studying conviction review units, conviction integrity units, whatever you want to call them. I think most people would say those are interchangeable terms. He studied them and he's trying to figure out best practices for how they work and how we can improve the criminal justice system. This particular paper that he's done, if you haven't looked at it, you can get it online. All you need to do is Google his name and the name of the, uh, the paper, and you should take a look at it. Because I think if you were a prosecutor and you were trying to go down the road of doing this work, this is probably one of the most important things that you can read. Because what he did is he talked to folks that run conviction integrity units throughout the country, and he really gathered information in the form of statistics, best practices, and at the end of the day, he said, this is really what you want to do, what you need to do in order to be successful. Now, in the course of actually studying and writing this paper, he actually um, coined the phrase crinos, which is like one of my favorite phrases. And that is he learned in talking to and looking at the various units throughout the country that there are such things as real units and pretty much fake units. And the fake units, as you can tell from the slide, are what he calls crinos, which are conviction review and name only. Hopefully I don't have to say too much more in order for that to make sense. The background for it though, however, is important. So I'm going to take just a second to tell you about that. Clearly we've seen this great proliferation of conviction integrity units since they started, whether or not you want to say it was Santa Clara that started it or Dallas. But we've had them in existence now for over a decade. And what's happened is we've had this national conversation about how horrifying it is to to recognize that our criminal justice system, probably the best in the world, actually convicts innocent people. And it's horrific, not only because of the defendant who gets wrongfully convicted and is innocent and sitting in prison, but it's also horrific because we recognize that when we get it wrong on that level, what that means for society is that the real perpetrator is still often out in society committing other crimes. So with this national conversation going on, I think politically, some prosecutors throughout the country said, hmm, I want to get on that bandwagon. And so what they would do is they would start conviction integrity units because maybe it was the way to get elected in their particular jurisdiction. If they said they cared about these issues, maybe the voters would like them. But in reality, some of them don't care about these issues too much. We've heard from several different speakers that oftentimes prosecutors and judges both elected in our criminal justice system really are more concerned about being tough on crime, how many jury trials they actually win and the number of years of prison sentences that they obtain. So that's the reality of a lot of folks. But meanwhile, we have this conversation about innocence. And so I think some politicians were savvy enough to say, as I said a moment ago, I'm getting on the bandwagon and I'm going to say I have one of these units. 
But when you look at various units through the lens of John Hallway's work, you'll understand that some of them aren't real, really real, hence the term crino. Crinos are very concerning to me because the fact that they exist actually cause great problems for the real ones. And so I think it's important for folks to have conversations and make sure that we are doing all that we can in our respective jurisdictions to try to kind of fetter out which ones are the real, which ones are the fake, and do what we can to make sure that if an elected is actually going to start one of these units, they start it with some sincerity that they can actually get something done, find the people that have been wrongfully convicted and do something about it. The other thing when I talk about you've got to have support from the top is implicit in that is it's one thing for your prosecutor, your elected DA to say this is meaningful to me, but it's another, and this is what I say often with Larry in the office, you've got to put your money where your mouth is. So if you believe in the work, you've got to understand that in order to get the work done, you've got to figure out how to get the money to fund the unit. We've talked a little bit about this over the last two days, and we all recognize, at least those of us that are in big jurisdictions. We know it's a very different equation when you're talking about an office of prosecutors where there's 300 versus a prosecutor's office where there's four <laughs> or five. Obviously, the resources needed are going to vary depending on the size of the office. Um, and in this particular case that I just put up here, this just happened at the end of August. I put it up here because, one, I think it shows you that prosecutors, when they want to have these units, they've got to be willing to fight and get the money. And there was a big successful fight to fund this particular conviction integrity unit in Kansas. It's interesting to me when you look at the amount of money that they got, and I certainly don't want to take away from it um, because that's a lot of money if you've never had money to do this kind of work. But when you look at it, it's $162,000 to fund a unit with three staff members. Um, so that's actually doing it on the cheap. Um, but the commitment was there and hopefully what will happen is it will grow as they start doing the work and the community understands the value of do doing this kind of work. When I talk about having support from the top, I think it is so important to be honest and say that even if you have the support from the top, I think most units will say that oftentimes just because the leader is supporting you doesn't mean that the old guard is supporting you. The prosecutors that have been there for 10 years or 20 years, and in Philadelphia in some case, 30 years. So you have this internal struggle that goes on in terms of your leader trying to send the message that this work is important, but you've got the other folks that are in the office that have been there for so long, way longer than your elected DA, and what ends up happening is some sort of unusual struggle. Um, the quote that we have on the slide up here actually comes from some of the naysayers in Philadelphia right now, former homicide prosecutors that were in the office and now are not in the office anymore because they didn't want to or could not work for Larry Krasner. Those folks being a homicide prosecutor in Philadelphia was their identity. And it is still their identity such that they've actually created these kind of um, clubs or cliques to still communicate pe with people in the office to have this internal struggle going on between what they believe is the traditional right way of prosecuting versus this crazy lefty liberal conviction integrity unit who's trying to unlock the prison doors and let everybody out. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at my team over here because they all know what I'm talking about. Um, and it, it's very, very difficult. And it's so important to understand that when we're talking about the culture, there's going to be various different levels of culture in the office. And there's going to be some things that are harder to change than others. And what I've learned is the prosecutors that have been there for a while are going to be the hardest to try to get their brains to kind of wrap, the, wrap around the idea of making Maybe we got it wrong, maybe we need to admit we got it wrong, and maybe we then need to take steps to fix it. 
I, you know, I, some of you guys might disagree with me. I kind of would like to know how many of you do, um, but especially coming from Philadelphia right now and Larry Krasner getting attention throughout the country of being the most liberal progressive prosecutor in the country, um, I personally do not think conviction integrity work is a partisan issue. I think too many people think the only way you're going to get a real unit and a unit that gets anything done is if you have a progressive leader in office. I'm able to say this to you because now I'm able to look at what is going on in Philadelphia versus what I saw happening in Texas. And so let me take just a couple of seconds. Are we okay on the PowerPoint? Great. Thanks. Let me take just a couple of seconds to show you kind of a comparison and contrast and then see what you think. Um, first and foremost, I mentioned to you that I worked for an elected DA in Dallas. And we've all heard that Dallas, of course, is one of the longest continuous units in the country. The person that actually created the Conviction Integrity Unit in Dallas was an African-American Democrat. And so a lot of people kind of attached the idea of this kind of work to the liberal progressive agenda. However, the DA that hired me actually was a Republican, and she won and beat the Democrat when she ran for DA in Dallas. A lot of people were very concerned thinking that a Republican couldn't have a true commitment to conviction integrity work. I'll tell you that absolutely was not the case when my boss, Susan Hawk, was actually in the office acting as the elected district attorney. And what I show up here for you is a case that we worked on with her approval and blessing every inch of the way, and that was we had a case involving a defendant who had spent more than 25 years in prison. He had been convicted of a double homicide. It was a drug deal that had gone bad, but the evidence that actually was used to convict him was a bite mark or so we thought, on the arms of one of the victims. We jumped into this case, looked at it very closely, and ultimately concluded that not only was it a wrongful conviction because we saw that there were lots of things that had gone wrong, such as Brady violations, but we also looked closely at the science and realized that the science regarding the bite mark at the time of trial, which was back in 1987, was, and, and I know some people said they don't want to use the word junk science, but I'm going to use it right now now because it was absolutely junk science. In fact, when we were looking at the case of 2015 and 2016, not only did we have scientists telling us that they couldn't even say if it was a bite mark on the victim's body, but we also had the original forensic odontologist look at the case and apologize because he said what he had testified to when he said that it was a bite mark on the victim's arm and that there was a one in a million chance that it could be anybody other than the defendant, he recognized it was wrong, it had no basis in science in 1987, and certainly it had no basis in science in 2015 or 2016. Susan Hawk, by approving the work we did, was the very first prosecutor in in the entire country to agree and that's very important for you all to understand because there are cases where courts have said bite mark evidence is bad. But Susan Hawk, as the elected DA, looked at all of that and agreed that it was bad science and agreed after looking at everything in the case that the defendant who had spent more than a quarter of a century in prison was actually innocent. Then. Enter the picture, Larry Krasner. Um, I've already talked to you a little bit about it, but I think everybody knows or has at least heard something about how, as I said, he is touted as the pro most progressive prosecutor in the country. One of the things on his agenda was to definitely take a strong position on this kind of work, conviction integrity. In Philadelphia, prior to my arrival, the unit was not a conviction integrity unit. It was a conviction review unit. Larry looked at it and said, I'm going to change that. And not only did he change the name, but he changed the way that the unit fundamentally works. And remember I mentioned a moment ago that when you think of resources in the context of support from the leadership, a lot of that is relative based on the size of the office, right? Larry promised me when he asked me to leave Austin and come to Philadelphia, he promised me that the unit that existed, which really was only about one and a half prosecutors strong, he promised me, hey Patricia, if you come to Philadelphia, I'm going to make sure that you have five prosecutors, 
I'm going to make sure that you have the support staff that you need and that you have an investigator. I started working for Larry on February 1st of this year, and I am so proud to say that we have five prosecutors, we have two paralegals, we have an investigator, and we've actually got another prosecutor starting in two weeks, and I think there's going to be more to come. So Larry absolutely has been committed to doing what he promised to do. Now keep in mind what I said was important for me at least in terms of the contrast between Texas and what I'm seeing in Philadelphia. So in Texas we have the Republican DA that supported the work. Then we've got Philadelphia with Larry Krasner. And I start thinking, well, wait a minute, um, and pardon me for describing it this way, but I, I really can't come up with any other description that fits it so well. What I'm seeing in Philadelphia in particular and Pennsylvania in general is a bit of a shit show in terms of the state of the criminal justice system, right? So in Philadelphia, they've had Democrats in office for a long period of time. Yet, if you look at the slide up here, Philadelphia has more people serving life without parole than any other jurisdiction um, and you look at the numbers and it just kind of blows your mind and so for me you know I started scratching my head thinking this just doesn't make sense in terms of us so often equating good criminal justice reform with progressive politics did not make sense. How is it Larry's in Philadelphia and we've, and, and of course we've inherited it. We've inherited this mess, but we inherited it from Democrats. How did that happen? Meanwhile, compare it with what's going on in Texas. I don't know if many of you guys know the politics in Texas, but Texas is a red state. Um, and Texas has been controlled in the House for a long time with Republicans. But if anybody is so inclined, I implore you to look at some of the legislative reforms that we've seen in criminal justice in Texas over the last decade. And I put up here just a few for you. Keep in mind, I talked to you briefly about the Michael Morton Act, which was open file discovery in criminal cases. And it unanimously passed in 2013 in Texas. It was and still is probably one of the most most progressive types of criminal discovery in the country, yet it was passed in a largely Republican state capital. In addition to that, you've heard a couple of people talk about 11073. I don't know that the number's going to register or you're going to remember it, but we heard several panel members talk about how Texas has this new science or junk science statute. Basically what it is, is it is a way to actually get relief in a post-conviction writ setting if you can establish that the science that was relied on at the time of trial is now unreliable. And that could be because of it was junk science in its entirety, but it could also be because the actual scientist has now changed their opinion. So that is a pretty remarkable provision. And what's happening in Texas, because that law was passed, is lots of bad wrongful convictions are getting vacated and innocent people are actually being set free because there's that avenue to get them relief based on looking at the science. HB 34 is also worth pointing out because we've heard so much about what are the major factors or the contributing factors to wrongful convictions of innocent folks. And what we've heard over and over again is eyewitness identification, we've heard false confessions, we've heard official misconduct, um, and we've heard junk science. Just last session in Texas, it also was passed largely through the work of Republicans to do what we call an omnibus bill, which was a bill that contained law regarding all of those different factors that lead to wrongful convictions. So we've got really good law on the books regarding eyewitness identification, false confessions. We now require recorded interrogations. There's also um, a jailhouse informant component. Remember Don Boswell talked about Tarrant County being the leader in trying to come up with a policy and a system for tracking um, the use of jailhouse informants or snitches, now Texas actually has a statewide law that requires prosecutors in every county to track that information, to disclose it to the defense, and then ultimately judges are required to let the defense impeach with that information even if some of the prior snitching cases result in dismissals of cases. So Texas is really far out there, but 
as I've said repeatedly, they're far out there even in the midst of being a red state governed by Republicans. This quote from Anthony Kennedy I just stumbled on recently, and I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with it, but this is kind of my last point on I'm not so sure that conviction integrity work is a partisan issue. Um, so I'm going to take just a second because I want you guys to kind of follow along with me because I think it's very striking. I will, I will also tell you that before I go through it, if you read Kennedy's speech in its entirety, what you're going to see is a lot of what he's talking about is also mass incarceration. So I don't want you to think I'm taking this out of context. But with that in mind, let's go with it for just a minute. So he does this speech in front of the ABA in 2003. And if you can, as we're going through this, try to remember who appointed Kennedy to the Supreme Court. The focus of the legal profession, perhaps even the obsessive focus, has been on the process for determining guilt or innocence. When somebody has been judged guilty and the appellate and collateral review process is ended, the legal profession seems to lose all interest. When the prisoner is taken away, our attention turns to the next case. When the door is locked against the prisoner, we do not think about what is behind it. We have a greater responsibility. As a profession and as a people, we should know what happens after the prisoner is taken away. Pretty amazing stuff. And anybody remember who appointed Kennedy to the Supreme Court? Reagan did, right? So there's a lot of people, regardless of whether they're Democrat or Republican, that are thinking about these ideas, that are saying that we need to do more as a system. So I say this in sum because I don't want people to think that if you're in a jurisdiction where your leaders are Republicans, that it means you can't do anything. I think that's wrong. I think that we all have a vested interest, regardless of what political side we're on, to say that our criminal justice system has value and we need to make sure that it is working at its best. And it is not working at its best if we're allowing wrongful convictions where innocent people have been convicted to remain in prison. It's one of my favorites, but it's true. Um, if you're doing this work, just know um, you are not going into it to be popular. In fact, I dare say, um, because this has happened to me now in two different places, that not only am I not popular, but I'm probably downright hated by some people. Um, this instance that I'm going to share with you guys was actually something, and, and, and I kind of hate to describe it this way, but I don't think there's a better way. This was an incident that hurt my feelings probably more than anything as a professional as a, and as a human being. So I'm in Dallas. I am committed to do the work, and I am doing the best job I possibly can. And while I was in Dallas, in July of 2016, a, a horrible tragedy occurred. And that tragedy is when the five police officers were killed not a mile from my office. Um, I will never forget the day. Um, you know, it's a day like so many days in our lives. We remember when the space shuttle blew up. We remember 9-11. I remember this day, and I remember my father, who lives in Ohio, being so concerned, knowing that I'm so close to where this is happening. It was a big deal. It was a big deal to everybody in our office. Everybody was frightened for a while. Um, and then, of course, what happens is it becomes a big deal to go pay your respects to the officers who had been, who had been shot and killed in the line of duty. One of the memorial services that they had for the office, officers was they were going to give out a certain number of tickets for people to attend the memorial service. And naturally, when you have five officers in your jurisdiction killed, prosecutors attending the memorial service is a big, important deal. Those tickets were given to the office, and they were given not to everybody in the office because the office has over 500 people, but they were given to make sure that the leadership and the administrative staff attended and basically were front and center to tell the Dallas community that they cared. I was considered part of that leadership, and I was the only person in that office that was part of the leadership that was not invited to go to the memorial service. And it was terrible. Um, and 
and there was never a big confrontation about why was I the one not invited, but I know that it was because of the biases and the dislike they had for me and what they thought I was doing in the office. And I think part of it was they thought because I was trying to undo convictions and blame bad actors who had misbehaved in the cases that surely that meant I didn't care for the police officers who had been killed. It, it, it was terrible, but I think it is very illustrative of how deep the cultural issues are and how prosecutors can really feel like if somebody's going into the office to take a look at past performances, they can only be doing it with bad motives. Flash forward to Philadelphia. Now, you'd think it was a whole lot better because of Larry Krasner. And Larry Krasner fired a lot of people when he took office. And he has made it very clear to everybody in the office that doing your job is important, but understanding why we're doing it different is also important. Despite that fact, as I've hinted and as I showed you guys a slide a little while ago, there is a lot of animosity and distrust in the office. And this book that you see on the slide is a book that literally was just published in a book signing party happened about 10 days ago. And the author of the book actually interviewed a bunch of people about what's happening in Philadelphia and what is the climate and the culture like in the office and what does the Conviction Integrity Unit mean to the prosecutors that have been there for a long time. And as you can see, this, I think, very good quote from a lawyer who does this kind of work in Philadelphia is essentially what I've tried to tell you. He recognizes it, and a lot of people do, that when you're doing this work within the office, you're seen as internal affairs and a lot of people are not gonna like you, and they're absolutely gonna distrust you because they think that you're just trying to point fingers and, and let people out and blame them for it. My last um, personal experience in terms of explaining how you will not be popular, and this is actually something that happened two weeks ago. Um, our unit was asked to look at a case um, regarding an innocence claim, but also a lot of other due process claims, ineffective assistance in particular. And it just so happens that the case that we're looking at, the defendant has a co-defendant where his case has already been vacated based on ineffective assistance, and the homicide unit is actually working that case right now to retry the co-defendant. Of course, we're looking at it as a unit, and we're going, oh my, there's some real serious problems with this case, and we need to dig deeper, and we need to try to figure out, is the defendant innocent? In doing so, of course, you've got to look at the files. And Philadelphia is in the dark ages. Not much is electronic, so almost all files are going to be physical files. Turns out that all the files are jointly kept together of the co-defendants, the one who's facing the retrial, the one who's claiming innocence and is not gotten relief. So I have to go ask the homicide prosecutor to let me look at those files. And I sat in her office with her boss for an hour and a half and basically was grilled and questioned about everything that I was doing and what right did I have to talk to her about the case because it was her case. She asked me questions about, well, are you really, you know, she didn't say it this bluntly, but what she was saying is, I don't trust you. You say you're looking at this other one, but you're really looking over my shoulder, aren't you? Um, she wanted to know what metrics we were using to determine whether or not the conviction was wrongful and whether the defendant was innocent. And ultimately, when I said, you know, I'm not, I'm looking at this case and I got to have the file in order to do my work, she refused to give me the file. Flash forward, probably less than a week later, she quit. Her boss told her that she had to make the file available to me. You've heard, shifting over now to another takeaway, you've heard so much about cognitive bias, um, any kind of bias in terms of the way we think and the way we look at cases. And so often, when we're doing this work, we're looking at and we're studying bias in the context, 
context of the bias from the prosecutors, the police officers, the judges, and maybe even the defense lawyers when they first tried the case. Then we start looking at the bias of the prosecutors when they are told that their case may get reversed or vacated. <laughs> what we don't talk a lot about is our own biases. I think Don Boswell from Tarrant County talked about that a little bit. And I, I say to you all that it is absolutely right and imperative. We've got to be educated and aware of the biases for everybody else, but it would be so hypocritical if we didn't understand how those same biases could affect what we're doing. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes putting this all in context for you and sharing with you some of my more favorite um, kind of psychological theories on bias. And I start here with one of my favorite quotes because I think it sets the stage for any discussion on how bias affects human judgment and thinking. And specifically, really what I'm trying to say by using this quote is just that what we do when we do this kind of work is we recognize how essential it is to challenge beliefs challenge our own beliefs. And we also have to recognize that oftentimes when we do that, we are at odds with the status quo. And so much of what I just said is being at odds with the status quo. And you have to be able to accept that in order to do the work. You have to be able to say it's a fight, but it's a fight worth fighting. Crime creates involuntary relationships between people. Once formed, they must be untangled. Absolutely true. And this is just up there to illustrate how difficult the work is and how complicated it is, particularly, and these were some questions asked of the panel earlier today, would you recognize that a person or a family has been victimized and they go through a process where they ultimately believe that the perpetrator of that crime was the right perpetrator who's been convicted and is justly serving time in prison. And then flash forward to where we're saying 30 years later, nope, it was wrong. And I think there was a question asked earlier of one of the panel members, why would victims be mad? And I think the answer kind of was a non-answer to some extent because it assumed the answer, which was why wouldn't they be mad? Um, and it is because when you face conviction integrity work, when you face undoing long-standing convictions, you are shattering a person's belief system that has lasted for years and years and years. Add another layer to that, because what I've seen in my work in Dallas and in Philadelphia is not only are you shattering it, but oftentimes some of the family members might have actually had information regarding the crime. They might have been a witness to the crime. So in addition to some saying, you know what, we got the wrong person, a lot of times there's a lot of guilt that these folks feel because they think that, oh my God, if we got it wrong, that means that I got it wrong. And so you have to understand the complexity of that. And when you go down this road, you've already got a very tangled relationship between the victim and the system. And you're then trying to figure out, gosh, am I tangling it more or, I'm, or am I helping to untangle it? One of my favorite books that deals with bias and the way that we make judgments and make decisions is this book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Has anybody read it or is anybody familiar with it? Um, take, if you're interested, take a look at it. It is a fascinating book, but I will tell you, um, just in full disclosure, it is one of the hardest books I've ever tried to read because it is so dense. Um, so I find myself where I can read about 10 pages and then my brain is so tired, I gotta set it down and come back to it later. But just to give you a short kind of synopsis of what the book is about, is the author has researched decision making and the way that our brains work and ultimately concluded Included that our brains are set up with two, dif two different systems. We have system one and system two. And you generally can assess how people make decisions based on what system of their brain are they using to make the decision. And specifically, you've got system one and system two. System one is kind of the easy way we make decisions. It's when our brain is working fast. It's pretty unconscious. We automatically form conclusions. And we use this part of our brain every day. And it's that part of the brain or that system that is the most prone to errors. 
Then on the other hand, you've got this other part of your brain where it's the tougher decisions and it's where we're forcing ourselves to slow down and consciously think through things and then have to come out at the end of it making decisions that are very complex. That part of our brain power or the way our mind works is the very difficult part. Too often what you see in wrongful convictions in our criminal justice system are people, and I'm going to say people in terms of police officers, prosecutors, defense lawyers, judges, and juries, are making decisions with the system one part of their brain. And so when you do that, you end up with decisions that are not as reliable than if you had done it by using system two. So much of what we're learning about cognitive biases is that if we're aware of the way that we make decisions in regard to system one, then maybe we can figure out how to slow down and figure out how to use our brains so we come up with more reliable decision making under system two. I'm going to just go through a couple of slides pretty quick, um, just reminding everybody what a cognitive bias is. And then share with you, um, this is, I, I don't have any children, but a friend of mine that does these presentations with me does have children, and we talk about bias a lot. And he told me he went home one day um, when his fourth grader had gotten out of school, and she was working on her homework, and he goes into Olivia's bedroom, and he sees these notes that Olivia has written. And my friend David is like, Olivia, you know, what is that all about? And she then proceeds to tell him how her teacher has taught her how to write write um, reports, book reports, how to summarize stories. And so David has Olivia explain it a little bit more. And so what Olivia says really quickly is, is she says, Dad, every time there's a story, you ought to always think about it in terms of somebody wanted but so then, somebody wanted but so then. And so David says, Olivia, tell me more. And so Olivia takes this and says, let me tell you in the context of Cinderella. And um, essentially, she goes into the Cinderella story and probably the most important aspect of it that David took away and that now I take away from it is so central to the good storytelling is always the but. There's always some drama that you need to be part of the story so it makes you kind of stop and then figure out how do you get through that and then hopefully get to the happily ever after. And David was sharing this with me and we started thinking and at the time that he shared this story we were defense attorneys together and we really were assessing what is it that defense attorneys do right and what do they do wrong. And so often when defense attorneys are trying to figure out how to tackle a criminal charge against one of their clients is criminal lawyers are trying to come up with the story of understanding how and why something happened. And so it was in that context that we said you got to make sure that you're analyzing the case through the lens of somebody wanted but so then. And if you leave out some of these aspects of the story telling, you're going to miss central components to the story. I've thought about that a lot and I brought it with me in the conviction integrity work because I think in the conviction integrity work that when we go back and we look at the cases, we can't just say how or we can't just say why. We've got to try to understand the whole story. And so often what becomes critically important is the but part of it in terms of, but where did things go wrong. And I think Mark Hale has talked about this a lot and it is, it's, it's, he does a great job of it, which is sometimes you think the story is A, when somebody comes in and says, look at this case, and then you start looking at the case and then you find out really the story is not A, the story is B, C, or D, and oftentimes you're figuring that out because you're looking at the butts in the cases and you're saying, but what about that eyewitness identification? And you start kind of telling the whole story and dissecting the case and then I think that helps us get to pretty good reliable conclusions when we do this kind of work. Quickly, suppression of doubt. That's another area that we see a lot in terms of how cognitive bias affects us in the criminal justice system. I want you guys, I'm going I'm to show you two quick slides and then I'm going to ask you two, two very easy answers about the slides. So I'm going to pause with each one before I ask the question. I just want to know, those of you that think that's true, raise your hand. True? White fish, white fish eat candy. Those of you that think it's false. Okay.
true? False. A lot of people are just not going to raise their hand on that one. <laughs> that one's a little harder. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Spinoza or read any of Spinoza's works, but basically what those two slides illustrate is I think something very important to understand in the way our brains work and the way we think. And that is so often we have to understand a statement with an attempt to believe it. You've got to understand what the idea means in order for it to be true. You've got to go through that process before you can actually get to the point of being able to unbelieve what it is you thought was true. Sounds really weird and it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around it, so let me kind of fill in the gaps a little bit. False but made up facts pairing with a visual lens understanding which is confused with the truth. The visuals go straight to the unconscious mind. It's kind of the reptilian part of the brain. Seeing is believing. So the purpose of those two funny slides was to see how it affects your brain. If I had just said, white fish eat candy without showing the visual, ordinarily you're going to have more people that are willing to say false than true. Same with the Dinka being a, a flame, a flash. Um, there's something about if we hear it and see it, our mind is going to process it, which then allows us to believe it and then ultimately conclude that it's true. And according to philosophers and scientists, that's the way your mind works and you've got to get there to where, as I said, what Spinoza tells us, you've got to get there before you're ever able to come back to saying it's not true. A recent example of this, and maybe this will be a little bit more illustrative, is what you hear on the news with the truthers. Um, and the truthers, the, what, what I'm referring to are those people that are out there saying that the children at Sandy Hook were not killed and that they've seen pictures of the children and that they're alive and that it's all a conspiracy. Um, it's so weird because our intellectual brain tells us that is so crazy, but the reality is a lot of the way people think and their brains work will allow them to believe that that is actually true because what it is is it's a plausible counter narrative that could be believed and if it could be believed then it could be true. This is a lot to kind of spit out and it's a lot to think about. Um, and if it's interesting to you, Google some of it. There's, there's a, just a plethora of information out there about all of this and it really does teach us to understand how and why we do certain things and apply it in the criminal justice context. And then I think it gives us some insight in terms of how can we try to guard against it. Just a couple more thoughts on cognitive bias and then I'll skip over to my next takeaway and that is hindsight bias and I put this up here because I think it's really important to do kind of a comparison with um, what we would call confirmatory bias with hindsight bias because I think these two are critical notions to understand in this kind of work. The confirmatory bias is what we see in the beginning of a case and that is where we've got a prosecutor who a police officer has come and said look I've got the guy that committed this homicide and here he is I'm giving you all the information and the prosecutor doesn't want to believe that they've got a cop that's either bad or stupid. The prosecutor wants to believe that they can rely on that police officer, so they're going to say, you know, if they investigated this case, they've got to be telling me the right thing, right? So then when that prosecutor looks at everything that the cop has given the prosecutor, they're doing it through the lens of a confirmation bias, and that is everything that they're going to see is going to confirm that in fact that cop is right, that they got the right doer who committed the crime. So think of that moving forward, confirmation bias. Now let me tell you what happens after the conviction and that's what I'm referring to as the hindsight bias. The hindsight bias oftentimes gets confused with confirmation bias but it's really very different. The hindsight bias is basically a, a, a belief perseverance. In other words, after the conviction has taken place, we want to believe if, if we played any role in it or if we have any belief in our criminal justice system, we want to believe that we got it right. So we say, God, 
gosh, we couldn't have convicted the wrong person. Therefore, that person is guilty. And then everything we hear after the fact, even if it proves to us that we're wrong, we're not going to accept because we are going to be affected by this hindsight bias or this belief perseverance. And so keep in mind that both of those things are going on in terms of the cases that we now know we got wrong and when we find that innocent people have been sent to prison. Theory perseverance, really quickly, um, you guys are probably familiar with this. If anybody has ever heard about the black swan or if they've seen some of the experiments that have been done, the black swan, of course, is the, the idea that all swans in the universe were white. And people would try to prove that all swans were white because every time they would see a white swan, they would say that proves that all swans are white. And the reality is it wasn't until somebody said maybe there's a black swan that of course we realize that the notion that all swans are right was wrong. Um, oftentimes this idea is told in the context of, as I said, experiments. And the easiest one to kind of share with you guys, and there's a great four or five minute clip if you Google it. Um, and it's this experiment where this um, psychologist is out asking a group of people about trying to figure out what a particular rule is based on information he gives them. So the experimenter goes out and he says to a group of people, okay, I'm going to tell you these numbers. Two, four, six. What I want to know from you is what number comes next and what's the rule. And so you watch this go on and everybody gets it wrong. Nobody can figure out really what what really is the next number, but more importantly, nobody can figure out what the rule is if the only information you're given is two, four, and six. And at the end of the experiment, what we learn is exactly what I just talked to you about, which is the, the theory or the perseverance um, theory that tells us that what we're looking for is we're looking for something that confirms what we think the rule is. So oftentimes people would say 2468 or they would say um, 12 or they would say all these numbers and they were all consistent with what they had already formulated was the rule. And the rule was something that they thought would confirm what they thought they knew when in reality, um, and Don Boswell talked about this, what you really need to do is you need to, you may think you know what the rule is, but the way to figure out what the rule is, is to try to disprove what the rule is. So if you think it's going to be every two numbers increase, then maybe what you do is you say, okay, instead of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, you say, well, maybe I'm going to say 3, 1. Um, and then by testing outside your comfort zone of what you think the rule is, then you may actually figure out what the rule is. I think from now on, I'm going to start using the clip again because the clip probably does a much better job of illustrating that than I just did. But it's fascinating. It's fascinating stuff to look at. Okay, moving quickly. Um, those of you that are familiar with John Hallway and Barry Sheck, I hope you chuckle a little bit when I put this slide up here. Those of you that aren't, we've talked a little bit about who John Hallway is. And then, of course, what I'm referring to is Barry Sheck, who runs the Innocence Project in New York. What we've seen of the last couple of years is we've seen Hallway going out there and espousing what he's learned from the study that he did that I referred to at the beginning of the presentation and the paper was printed in April of 16. And then we see Sheck writing on conviction integrity units and both of them are trying to understand how they work, how do you measure their success, what are the best practices for them moving into the future. If you want to look at the papers, I don't think you're going to see, see huge differences between their ultimate conclusions and the data that they rely on to reach those conclusions. Conclusions. I think where you're going to see the differences between Hallway and Shack is if you go ever listen to them speak about this subject matter. And to me, the biggest bone of contention I think they have with each other is Hallway looks at all of this in the context of how do we make it better and how do we do that in a blame-free environment. In other words, Hallway's not terribly interested in saying that when we find the Brady violations that we need to spend a ton of time trying to figure out how to hold that prosecutor accountable for the Brady violation. Instead, what Hallway says is we ought to be looking at the criminal justice system very much like the airline industry looks at plane crashes. In an error-free environment. So that way we end up with a just culture because we're all looking at it, trying to figure out where did we go wrong and how do we prevent it from happening in the future. 
I don't think Barry necessarily disagrees with that concept, but Barry, on the other hand, if you've ever heard him talk, as I said, you're going to hear him talk and pound his fist on the table. Yeah, that's all fine in some circumstances, but there are going to be circumstances where there needs to be some blame. There needs to be some accountability. And as I said to you all in the beginning, the Michael Morton case that I worked on in Texas, Barry Sheck was the lead lawyer on that case. And if it weren't for Barry Sheck saying there needs to be accountability for egregious intentional behavior when prosecutors cheat, the prosecutor in that case would never have been held accountable, would never have been sentenced to actually serve jail time, and would never have lost his law license. At the end of the day for me, I conclude that they're both right. I think what John Hallway is saying makes a whole lot of sense, but at the same time, I think that Barry's right, and I think that there are circumstances where we do need to say that there will be personal accountability when actors in the system do something wrong. I'm going to illustrate um, these two cases, and I'm trying to stay away from talking about war stories, but these two video clips that I'm going to pay, play for you, I think, really illustrate a little bit of what Barry is saying in the context of prosecutorial misconduct, and maybe a little bit of what Hallway is saying as well. <coughs> you guys want to play? This is the Michael Morton prosecutor. That was the worst testimony I've ever seen from a person in my life, and I've been a lawyer for 27 years. And that was the DA that tried the case, who then was a judge for about 15 years before he actually got up on the stand to try to defend the egregious Brady violations that he had committed in the prosecution of Michael Morton. To this day, despite the overwhelming evidence, he is unable to accept any responsibility for his actions and even admit what everybody agrees Agrees is powerful Brady evidence was even Brady. Contrast that with the next slide in regard to the bite mark case. And I good told evening, you I'm now. Shelley Slater. Thanks for joining us here for News 8 at 6. I'm Don McKay. This evening, an important story we've been covering for years is close to its final chapter. Stephen Cheney was smiling in the courthouse today. It's been years of uncertainty, of suffering, but well, today, finally, everyone agrees he did not commit the crime. It all came down to bite mark evidence in a story with many twists. News 8's Tanya Iser has been covering this story for years. She talked with Cheney today, where he now calls himself a truly free man. It was a happy day to be in court for Stephen Cheney, a man convicted almost 30 years ago on flawed bite mark evidence. I'm free, man. Yeah, I'm not on bond anymore. Or nothing. <laughs> the hearing before District Judge Dominique Collins lasted not even 10 minutes. Prosecutors told Collins that they now believe Cheney was actually innocent of the 1987 double murder. They revealed that they now have an alternative suspect. Former prosecutor Neil Pask was the one person to take the stand. I didn't recognize the, the faultiness of the science at that time, and um, I truly thought it was you know, a righteous prosecution back in 1987. You know, 29 years later, I do realize that he is completely innocent, and I'm sorry. The court erupted in cheers as the judge ended the hearing. Ten months ago, Cheney was released on bond after serving 28 years inside of Texas prison. He got the call last night. The prosecutors had agreed to the innocence finding. Woo! <laughs> That's what I said on the phone. I Cheney met with Pask before the hearing. He says he forgives him. The judge is recommending that the Court of Criminal Appeals find him innocent and grant him relief. The judge is also recommending that the Court of Criminal Appeals find that the evidence used against him was junk science. His wife, who stuck by him for decades, was there, as were his two sons, Lonnie and Dustin. John Tatum, his original defense attorney, came too. After all these years, yeah, um, <laughs> does not help me. After other exonerees who attended his hearing gathered for a photo, they were 
brotherhood born out of having been there. So we're going to see yeah. Stephen Cheney again. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Every time they exonerate one, I'll be there. Tanya Iser, Channel 8 News. It, it was fascinating for te Texas to witness that because the way Ken Anderson behaved, I think so much contributed to the demand for the accountability um, because the evidence was so clear, but the prosecutor was absolutely unwilling and unable to accept any responsibility for what occurred. The Cheney case that happened just about two years later is a remarkable change from that where you see the prosecutor on the stand not only accepting the role that he played in the case, but actually willing to take the time to look at the case and say, we got it wrong. And now I think that this person that I'm responsible for putting in prison is actually innocent. And I think that it's an important lesson for us all to learn in terms of how we all react to when these cases are coming um, to us and we're seeing all the things that were broken during the, the process of the trial. Um, so Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on you a little bit now just to talk about your cases in Brooklyn. Um, and Mark, I should have asked you, I don't know if you've read this article, but this is a fascinating article about the work that Mark and his unit are doing in Brooklyn. Um, if you want to look at it, the title of it is Looking Beyond the White Bears in Criminal Justice. Um, the idea behind the title and the psychological experiment that's referenced up on the slide is that if we all sat in a room and we did an experiment again and I told you all, okay, I'm going to let you just think silently to yourself and do everything you can during five minutes of thinking to not let the phrase or the photo of a polar bear enter your mind. And if I tell you that, part of the instruction is also, but I want you to be honest, as you sit there in silence thinking, every time a polar bear enters into your mind, ring a bell. And so with this experiment, what studies have shown is that despite how hard we try and despite the instructions to not think about a polar bear, most of us think about a polar bear. And the studies say not only do we think about it, but most of us are going to think about it every minute in that five minute period. Um, so it, it is that kind of setup that starts telling the tale of some of the cases or a lot of the cases that Mark has been working on in Brooklyn. What I'm referring to specifically are the cases involving Detective Scarcella. This article basically says that Detective Scarcella, and for those of you that are not familiar with it, this is a homicide detective in the 80s and 90s, Mark, do I have that right? Um, responsible for many, many convictions and heralded as a hero among many police officers. But what Mark and his team have found is that many of the convictions are not good convictions. And many of them are not good convictions specifically because of things Scarcella did or didn't do. And so because of that, there's been so much written about these convictions getting vacated and Scarcella's role and what should happen into Scarcella because not only did he cause all of these people to spend hundreds of years in prison, but I think the numbers in terms of what it costs, New York is about 50 million mark in terms at least $50 million. So these articles talk about, you know, yes, this work is important, but do we need to be thinking more in terms of folks like Scarcella? And the author of the article basically says Scarcella has become the polar bear when we think about um, vacating these wrongful convictions in Brooklyn. And the question the author poses is, can safety be pursued by asking who after a criminal justice disaster and skipping the why and how? Let me explain to you why he posed this question. He posed this question because according to so much of the media reports of what has happened in Brooklyn is despite the fact that all of these convictions have been vacated, I don't know, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office has ever taken an official position to say that not only can they prove Scarcella engaged in misconduct, but they're actually going to take affirmative action for it. In fact, I think it's been the opposite. It's been, we can't say that it was indeed provable misconduct, and even if we could, there's not really anything we could do with it because of the passage of time. Do I have that right, Mark? Yeah. 
I'm always weary to rely just on the media reports, but that is how this question has come up. So it then brings me to the next question. When we look at these cases, I mean, how should we be looking at them? And I, I implore you to think in terms of Hallway, Sheck, and I'm going to say also Mark in Brooklyn. Who is responsible when we uncover that people have been wrongfully convicted and they are actually innocent? I think the right answer, um, certainly more often than not, is that everyone involved in the system to one degree or another is responsible. And as crazy as it may sound, what I just picked on Ken Anderson in that clip and how terrible his testimony was, I don't know if you'll remember, he said, you know, I can't imagine what I did wrong. I don't think I did anything wrong. He says it's a system failure. And to some extent, I mean, it is a system failure, but the system is made up of people and people fail. And so clearly, I think when we understand that more often than not, there are multiple causes that led to the wrong, wrongful conviction, then of course there are multiple people that are responsible for those co um, causes that led to the wrongful conviction. We got to ask how did it occur, but you have to understand when you ask that question, how did it occur, to answer that riddle you have to ask more questions. The answer, these are bad people, just doesn't suffice. And I tell you to think back of the, the little shortcut that Olivia, David's daughter, taught us about looking at stories and making sure that you're asking all the questions. Although I do believe that there are times when accountability needs to be a priority, I also recognize that we also have to be very mindful when we're analyzing these cases and we're trying to learn from them that we are all able to look past the idea that there's just one big villain that caused it. You heard a little bit about this from the panel discussion yesterday, and now that I'm in Philadelphia, I understand it so much more. When we are measuring the success of a conviction integrity unit or a conviction review unit, we really can't fall into, we measure it simply by the number of exonerations. And what I say to you about that is we have to be careful to not fall into the traps that the prosecutors that tried the cases fell into when what was so important on the front end was how many jury trials did they win versus how many did they lose? That can't be the metric for figuring out whether or not we're doing the right thing and we're doing what we can to undo what we consider maybe was an injustice. Along those lines, we, we heard from the prior speaker talk about the ethical rules in Ohio. I want to talk to you a little bit about the model rules of ethical conduct um, for prosecutors. And so what I have up here on the screen is rule point three eight. And I don't know if many people have read the model rule. If you haven't, you need to because it is super important. Because I think where we're headed with conviction integrity work is I think we are going to get to a place where all of the states in this country adopt the model rules of ethical or professional responsibility in the context of what a prosecutor's obligation is post-conviction when a prosecutor has evidence that a defendant who was convicted may indeed be innocent. And not only does it say we got to do something about it, but it says what we have to do about it. And that is we have an ethical obligation to go to the courts and try to right the wrong if in fact there is evidence that we got the wrong person. Now keep in mind it's the model rule right now. And there's only a handful of states that have adopted it. There's about 13 states that have adopted a modified version, but the vast majority of states have not gotten here yet to tell us ethically what do we have to do when we believe we've convicted an innocent person. So you've got to keep that in mind in terms of measuring the success of a unit and then I want you to couple that with some thoughts I have now being able to compare jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Another reason why aside from just getting into the numbers game and really becoming what we criticize on the front end 
in is whether or not you can actually successfully exonerate somebody, of course it has a lot to do with the facts that you've been able to uncover in your investigation, but all too often it has more to do with the law in your jurisdiction and what it enables you to do once you're sitting there with a final conviction. In, in Pennsylvania, I have learned just in the nine months that I have been there that the law is written in such a rigid way that even as prosecutors believe we have an innocent person in prison, we are having the darndest time trying to figure out how do we get into the courtroom and get a judge to actually recognize that and grant relief. It can be done, but as I said, the law is so narrowly written. Prosecutors in Pennsylvania do not have the authority, despite what we think our ethical obligation should be, to go make a wrong a right by actually setting aside a conviction. Texas is a little like Pennsylvania, but I'll tell you it's better than Pennsylvania in the sense that the law at least does not leave you at the mercy of a very narrow law being interpreted by one judge, which is what Philadelphia does. Texas, on the other hand, has the ability to have the highest court in the state consider the statute and consider whether or not the facts actually rise to the level of proving that somebody was wrongfully convicted and or actually innocent. And then finally, I have to say, Mark is the lucky duck, and he's not the only one, because there are states that allow prosecutors to essentially have the discretion to say, look, we have looked at this case, we think it's a wrongful conviction, and or we think the person is innocent, and so what we are going to do is we're going to recommend that the conviction be vacated in the interest of justice. That, I think, and if anybody knows of one that's any more liberal, I think is probably the most liberal law in the country that allows units like conviction integrity units to get this very important work done. I hope that where we find ourselves is adopting the model rule, recognizing that there is a constitutional basis in the right to relief when you've convicted an innocent person, and that we all find ourselves with statutes more akin to New York's. Don't wrongfully exonerate either. That's something that I've learned. We had a case recently in Philadelphia where it was sent to us where a federal judge had actually written an opinion saying that he believed the defendant was innocent based on the evidence that had been presented, but the case had been procedurally defaulted. So the case comes to us and we're asked to look at it to figure out if a new case that had been handed down by the United States Supreme Court would allow that defendant to get back in front of that federal judge who believed he was innocent, taking away the procedural bar. Sounded like a wonderful case, and it sounded like we were going to be able to right or wrong at least a federal judge existed. But we looked at that case very closely, and it still shocks us all to this day because this case has been litigated for probably 25 to 30 years. And when we looked at the case, oh my God, we found evidence in our own file that the defendant was not innocent, that the defendant had confessed in four pages of detail in a PSI after the conviction, he confessed to the crime. And we could not ignore that evidence despite the fact that we had a willing participant judge who was believing that the defendant was innocent. And we absolutely understood that we had to bring that information to light because if we start saying we're gonna exonerate when somebody is not factually innocent, we call into question everything we're doing as conviction integrity units throughout the country. Learn from exonerees, and I'm almost done, and I, I think we'll have a few minutes left over for Mark to do, give his closing remarks. But I, I, I told you guys at the beginning, I learned so much from the work that I did on the Michael Morton case. In addition to just learning about the system, I fortunately became very good friends with Michael Morton. And in that context, I learned that there is so much to learn from exonerees. And so I'm going to wrap up my presentation by sharing with you guys a few thoughts. And I do this. Um, um, by putting it in the framework of what I've learned from Michael Morton and other exonerees has taught me a lot about grace, both in terms of the verb and the noun, and it's taught me a lot about character. 
Michael Morton could have been angry, seeking revenge. He lost his wife. He lost his freedom. He lost his young son, who was three years old at the time of the crime. When Michael got out of prison 25 years later, his son had been raised to believe that Michael had, in fact, killed his mother. Since Michael has been released, he has reunited with his son, Eric. And as you can see, he says they're enjoying a rediscovered father-son relationship. He is so close to his son Eric now that he is part of Eric's family where there are three grandchildren and actually one on the way that is coming any minute. And Michael has remarried. So much of what Michael has taught me is, as I said, grace and that life is short and you need to do what you can to move on and not be full of vengeful thoughts. He often likes to say, you know, certainly he admits, he says, I spent 10 years in prison trying to figure out how I was going to kill the prosecutor who put me in here. Um, and he said that he finally realized after many, many years that thinking that way and feeling that way was akin to drinking poison and hoping that other people were going to die from it. Um, and I know that he stole that quote from somebody else, but I think it's beautiful and it says so much about him and how so many exonerees come out and actually come out and they're good, strong, productive people um, in our communities. Closing thoughts. In all of this, what I've learned is whether we're prosecutors or defense lawyers, we've got to figure out how to work better in the system. I've spent so much time talking about problems in the past, but we can't ignore that we've got to try to figure out how we prevent them from happening in the future. So my closing thoughts are, it's not just working differently, we have to work better. And particularly when we're talking about Brady claims um, and ineffective assistance, we've got to make sure that prosecutors are getting all the information about a case from the police, then the defense is getting all the information from the prosecutors, and as Dr. Phil says, people who have nothing to hide hide nothing at all, and we need to operate in our criminal justice system based on that notion. At the end of the day, the evidence is what it is, and I hope all of us agree with this. I would prefer even to fail with honor than win by cheating. And finally, favorite quote from Abraham Lincoln and certainly talk about this with Michael Morton all the time. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. And that is so true in regard to prosecutors and who we are and what we're able to do within the system. Finally, and this really is finally, to explain a little bit more about the title of my presentation, Why Choose to Go to the Moon? We choose to go to the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And this is John F. Kennedy um, from a speech that he gave before we went to the moon. And in the speech, he says, and of course, I, I think this is conviction integrity work. We're not doing this because it's easy. We're doing it because it's hard. And in Kennedy's speech, he says one challenge or the challenge that we are, it's a challenge that we are willing to accept. That's why we choose to go to the moon. That's why we choose to do this work. It's one we are unwilling to postpone, and it's one which we intend to win. Thank you. So I know it's been a, it's been a great two days, but a long two days, and a lot of you have flights to catch. So I just want to close by just saying thank you to all the sponsors. Thank you to all the speakers. I mean, for me personally, um, hearing some of the prosecutors and police officers and chiefs of police from around the country and the things they said and the way they have changed their practices is something I couldn't have imagined just a few years ago. So this has been very enlightening for me. Um, thank you all for attending and we hope this is something we'll be able to repeat and someday we'll be doing this in Ohio with a gigantic lecture hall. Thank you.